Hello everyone, from wherever you might be, and welcome to Rook Talks Book Talks. I'm your host, Rook Jones, here to do as the title says and talk to you about books. So, whether you're young or old, listening to this at home or abroad, why don't you pick up a nice cozy beverage and get comfortable? I'll tell you about some nice books today. Apologies in advance if I sound a little bit nasally, despite my best editing efforts. I am, unfortunately, recording this at the tail end of a pretty bad cold, so, yeah. Anyways, let's get on with the video! One of the hardest things to come to terms with in life can be realizing that you are an individual in a world that sets itself up to be a homogenous monolith. Sometimes it's hard to deal with the fact that you are unique in a world that doesn't always show you. So today's video is a book list dedicated to books that deal with conformity and social difference, either by the standards of the in-book universe or by ours. I've made it a mission to select literature where either society is being challenged in some way, minor or major, or someone other than the usual white straight guy shows up to hog the spotlight. Diversity for my definition includes gender, both including transgender individuals and cisgender ones, race, ethnicity, and physical and mental disabilities. Before we begin, of course, I want to just remind you all that if you don't have the money to buy books, please check with your local libraries. Not only can you get physical books or audiobooks at many library locations, a lot of libraries are working to get ebooks available through different apps like OneDrive and Libby, so you can read books on your smartphones for free with a library card. If you're still in school, then check out your library there, too. Without further ado, here are 10 books or book series I really like that just so happen to talk about today's topic in no particular order. I will present them with the book title, author names, and genre. These will all also be in the video description too, in case you still need help finding them. Number 1, An Enchantment of Ravens by Margaret Rogerson. Fantasy adventure, romance if you look the right way. This is actually my favorite book as of working on this video. I'm not exaggerating a bit in saying so, this is actually my favorite book. This book is written with a really gorgeous voice for imagery, and the way the plot unfolds is compelling enough that this is one of few books that I can say I've reread at least a couple of times. With lovely pacing and a boot, An Enchantment of Ravens is something I find myself constantly recommending to friends. Rogerson's book follows a painter by the name of Isabel in the world of Whimsy, where the Fae crave human craft that they cannot make themselves. When Isabel encounters the Autumn Prince, Rook, she makes the mistake of painting human sorrow into his eyes, which threatens his position among the cruel Fae. As the plot unfolds, it quickly becomes apparent that Rook is unlike his fellow Fae, expressing feelings in ways that have been outlawed by the Alder King and threaten both the Autumn Prince and Isabel. This book is probably one of the weirder entries of being different in society, considering it's about fey folk rather than humans, but Rogerson does a good job building a world that explains the rules about fey very well, including how differences between they and humans cause conflict. The story is about navigating the cultural disparity of fey folk and humans. Number 2 Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. Technically, this is a series, but I'm only talking about Howl's Moving Castle for this. Fantasy, science fiction, adventure, and romance, I guess, if you squint somewhere. While I'd love to talk about all three of the books in the Howl's Moving Castle series, unfortunately, I've only had a chance to read the first as of putting this list together. That being said, most of you are probably familiar with the eponymous Studio Ghibli movie with stunning animation and visuals. This book has some familiar characters to the Ghibli movie, but quite notably focuses more on the character of Sophie. The movie is good, and you should most certainly see it if you haven't, but I'm here to talk about the book. As for her writing style, Diana Wynne-Jones writes in a very frank tone. Though her books are written in a third person, you still get a wonderful taste for the character and thoughts of Sophie as she struggles to solve the mysteries of Hal and Calcifer. Threaded with comedic incidents as well, it's hard not to read this book without a chuckle or two here and there. Jones's book, as I said, focuses more on Sophie's development throughout the novel. As the firstborn of three sisters, Sophie has accepted that, in the world she lives in, she is destined for a mundane life. 
Firstborn daughters never do anything interesting, after all. All they do is fail. When she meets the terrible mood of the Witch of the Waste, Sophie is cursed and must find a way to untangle the enchantment. Number 3. The Rest of Us Just Live Here by Patrick Ness. Humor, fantasy fiction. The Rest of Us Just Live Here is a witty commentary on the common tropes you usually see in the YA genre, while providing a semi-serious discussion on living life with mental illness, parents who expect the world out of you, and a world that is incredibly ridiculous to the point of threatening the lives of people. Patrick Ness writes with a very good eye for character development and relationships. The main group are high school students, and despite the fantastical paranormal elements, gives room for a conversation relevant to living with real-world differences that are present with OCD and eating disorders. The main character, Mikey, struggles with his OCD trying to relapse in the novel and has to actively fight the urge to count and get into loops. The premise of the novel is quirky and entertaining, and while Ness tells one story, another is going on in the background which would, in another book, probably be the main story. In fact, The Rest of Us Just Live Here is based on the idea that end-of-the-world events are common, and chosen ones show up all the time. Is Mikey one of the chosen ones? Nope. His friend is just worshipped by cats, and Mikey wants to ask his crush out to prom. Normal high school stuff, right? Number 4. The Nemesis Series, which includes Dreadnought and Nemesis, with more to be announced. By April Daniels. Science fiction, fantasy, superhero fiction. Trans-lesbian superhero main characters? In my video? Oh, it's more likely than you think. The Nemesis series, which currently only has two books out at the time of making this video, is a book that takes the trans experience and upscales it into the realm of fantasy and science fiction. Normally I would try to spice things up with my own summary here, but really the author's summary has me beat. Here's what Dreadnought has to say for itself. Danny Tozer has a problem. She just inherited the powers of the world's greatest superhero. Until Dreadnought fell out of the sky and died right in front of her, she was trying to keep people from finding out that she's transgender. But then her secondhand superpowers transformed her body into what she'd always wanted it to be, and now there's no hiding that she's a girl. It should be the happiest time of her life, but between her father's dangerous obsession with curing her girlhood, her best friend suddenly acting like he's entitled to date her, and the classmate who is secretly a masked vigilante, Danny's first week living in a body that fits her are more difficult and complicated than she could have imagined. She doesn't have much time to adjust. Dreadnought's murderer, a cyborg named Utopia, still haunts the streets of Newport City. If Danny can't sort through the confusion of coming out, master her powers, and stop Utopia in time, humanity faces extinction. Wow, what a book. It should go without saying that being trans in a place where people don't want you to be trans is a tough situation. One of the book's main conflicts is the fact that Danny's parents want her to conform to their ideas about their child. Danny spends a lot of time in these books trying to figure out where she belongs in this complicated network of identity and superhero politics. Number 5. The Monsters of Verity Duology, which includes This Savage Song and Our Dark Duet, by V. E. Schwab. Post-apocalyptic science fiction fantasy. This duo of books by Victoria Schwab are an action-packed mix between post-apocalyptic and paranormal fantasy genres. In this world, from the sins of humans come monsters born of dark acts. Corsai, Malkai, Sunai. One drinks blood, one eats flesh, and the other takes souls. Kate Harker has spent years trying to get back to Verity, where she pines after the acceptance of her father. That is, if burning down a church and brutally stabbing a Malkai in the chest with a crowbar can be considered pining. On the other side of Verity's Wall, which splits the town between its two ruling factions, Harker and Flynn, August Flynn finds himself alienated by the world. As one of three Sunai in existence, he seeks to be of use to his father, and is sent to the other side of the Wall, where he will have to navigate the treachery of school life along with Kate's aloof personality. Oof, where do I start? Both our main characters here bring some interesting notes to the table regarding the idea of fitting in with society. Kate wants to prove that she's at the top of the food pyramid, and where her development takes her means understanding what that entails. The order of things in Verity included. August, on the other hand, is a character who is distinctly not what he is trying to be. You get a lot more of him struggling with his identity in the second book of the duology, but the first is heart-wrenching, and I don't hesitate to say that I connect a, a lot with August as someone struggling with a lot of the same issues he does. 
noise sensitivity, anxiety, and the whole shebang, minus the turning into a rampaging demon when I'm starved thing. Well, probably. Number six, Rick Riordan's books and the Rick Riordan Presents imprint. A lot of paranormal fantasy and adventure. Look, Rick Riordan writes a lot of books. I could say one series, but his first series doesn't give complete justice as to why his books are a smorgasbord of diverse representation. The man won the Stonewall Award for one of his recent books for crying out loud. When I heard he included a gender fluid character in his Magnus Chase series, I did a little scream and then decided that my non-binary self needed to catch up on almost 15 years of reading. Considering there are 34 books there, it's taking me a bit, but my cute bookmarks and I are ready to tackle every one of them. Riordan has a very good voice for pacing and characterization. While in some of his books he writes in third person, he is deliberate about letting his readers know about what the characters are thinking. This isn't surprising considering Riordan writes in first person for the Magnus Chase series. Anyways, if you aren't familiar with Riordan, he writes adventure paranormal fantasy books about the ancient gods interacting with our world. Monsters, deities, titans, and cataclysmic schemes are all on the plate, and it's up to a bunch of kids with godly parents to fix things. The first series follows Percy Jackson, a boy who struggles with dyslexia and, when he's attacked in school, is thrust into the world of Calf Hampblood, a place for demigods to train that is safe from the dangers of monsters. When Percy finds out he is a son of one of the big three and learns of the theft of Zeus's lightning bolt, he's expected to go on a quest to find the culprit and sate the angry god's rage. With that on the plate, it's also worth giving the Rick Riordan Presents imprint a shout-out as well, giving diverse authors a place from which to make sure their books about diverse cultures are read. We have a pretty big gap between who writes books and who reads them, and this sort of imprint by a familiar name like Rick Riordan will guarantee you books that you'll probably enjoy if you like Riordan's stuff, written by people you probably wouldn't pick up unless something like this enticed you towards their stuff. All in all, if you like supernatural fantasy, creative retellings of mythology, or diverse kids being the one to save the day, check out Rick Riordan if you want to keep something for the long run, or check out the imprints if you want something you can keep up with a bit easier. Arusha and the End of Time is one of the books in the imprint that is getting another entry quite soon, but it's definitely not as intimidating as the big 30 plus books Riordan has on his shelf. Number 7. In Real Life by Cory Doctorow and Jen Wong. Contemporary Fiction Graphic Novel. This book is a brief but gorgeous run-through of the politics of video gaming. Our main character, Onda, loves a game called Course Gold Online, a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. When she's approached by a feminist activist, she makes a female-presenting avatar and, with a friend, discovers the undercurrent of gold farmers in the MMO's community. The story is a bit brief, and I'll admit I read this and wanted a bit more time spent developing things, but it follows Onda as she realizes the differences between certain issues aren't as different as they might seem. Without giving away too much, the graphic novel begins a discussion on the confusing politics of online video game paid work, as well as who does what work. What's the difference between value placed on digital work and physical work? Where this book primarily shines and where it fits into this theme is through its discussion of the difference of labor and the value of labor. Maybe that sounds a bit ridiculous considering this is a graphic novel about someone who loves video games, but it's definitely a conversation that's at the forefront of the novel and worth your time to consider if you haven't before. Number 8. My Hero Academia by Kohei Horikoshi. Science fiction, fantasy, superhero fiction, graphic novel. This is the one exception for this list that I'll make where I'll talk about the watchable adaptation, and that's mostly because I shed a lot of tears watching the subbed version of My Hero Academia. Manga or anime, the decision is usually a hot debate, but I'll let you make your own choice as to which you pick. Either way, My Hero Academia is one of the most heart-wrenching entries on this list. In a world where people are born with special powers called quirks, Izuku Deku Midoriya was born without a quirk. He looks up with hope to one of the world's most famous heroes, All Might. Despite lacking a quirk, Deku is determined to be like All Might, a famous superhero who helps people. It'll take a lot of grit and hard work if he has any hope, especially if he wants to make it past the entrance exams of UA High, a prestigious hero academy. I'm trying not to give away too many spoilers here, but this series is fun and will make you probably cry. Like I said, Deku is quirkless in a world where quirks are normal. 
Much of the buildup in the series follows the disparity between Quark abilities and their usefulness in society, and Deku's strategy to make it to the top is so unique for his world that he garners all kinds of surprising attention. As season 1 is only 13 episodes long, if you choose the anime route, it'll be about 6 hours of content in all. You can watch it through a provider like Crunchyroll for free and still support the producers. Both the anime and manga are currently ongoing, with the anime working on its third season in Japan right now, and the manga in 21 Tonkoban volumes. It's looking as if a 22nd is on its way. Number 9. Not Your Sidekick by C.B. Lee Superhero Fiction, Science Fiction, Dystopian Fiction Wow, uh, I accidentally picked a lot of books about being powerless in a world that expects you to have power by a very strict definition of the word. Whoops. Anyways, like Dreadnought, I originally picked this book and the next book on the list up because I am constantly in need of more queer literature in my life. Not Your Sidekick by C.B. Lee is the first of the Sidekick Squad series, which has two books out and at least two more slotted for release in the future. The first book follows the plight of Jess Tran, who has just spent her whole life hoping she would have latent superpowers. Her mother has super strength, and her father the power of flight. So far, however, Jess is nearly 17 and has no sign of either. She's tried anything, and frustratingly approaches the age where people are considered a lost cause for superpowers. In the middle of this all, she lands an internship that ends up being for the local supervillain duo. If this mess wasn't mess enough, she's working with someone who's been her crush for years. How the heck do you navigate this? Lee's book follows a bisexual girl of color, so that's definitely one big check mark for my criteria there. That's not all though. Lee's entire novel provides the question of what counts as talent. What does it mean to have strength? What does it mean to do something worthwhile? And who decides that? All of these questions are asked by Lee's novel, and I hope to see more of this thought continued in the next books of the series. As it is, Lee has the compelling voice for character development that makes reading her work investing and rewarding. Honestly, I ended up staying up irresponsibly late just to finish reading this one, and I'm immensely excited to read the next book in the series, which looks like it focuses on Jess's friend, Bells. Number 10. The Summer of Jordi Perez and the Best Burger in Los Angeles by Amy Spaulding. Romantic Comedy. Hey look, another entry that got in almost exclusively because it's queer lit. Also, the main character is actually a person that isn't just model thin or assumed average athletic, which is nice to have for once. This time it's a light, fluffy romantic comedy about a gal with self-esteem issues and a serious taste for fruit patterns and fashion. Abby Ives is convinced she's the sidekick to everyone else's romance. She's the quirky chick giving dating advice while the spotlight is somewhere else. She's the one who analyzes texts for her best friend Malia and inevitably hooks her up with a guy. Obviously, being gay, plus size, and having terrible self-esteem means she's not going to actually find love herself, right? Not even if she thinks the girl she's crushing on at her internship is really cute. And that girl thinks Abby is cute and photogenic too? Oh no, she's not the sidekick to this story, is she? The Summer of Jordi Perez is a quick little romp that's maybe a little cliche, but that's okay because it's cute and gay as heck. Rom-coms aren't normally my thing, but believe it or not, I actually cried some for this one. Also, unrelated, but the author signed my copy and stamped it with a rainbow glitter burger stamp. This is certified gay stuff. In the process of writing and working on this project, there are a few things that I've learned. Most importantly, however, is that I have a very specific taste for fiction, and that there's a lot of queer lit that's out there. If you're ever in the market for something with diverse characters, if I didn't hit one of your notes that you needed here, feel free to ask me for the book lists that help me find these wonderful books. I know for a fact that YA and Tarot Bang has a few lovely lists for queer literature and characters who struggle with mental illness. Interrobang is responsible for letting me know about the Monsters of Verity duology, and I know they've recommended The Rest of Us Just Live Here for its representation of OCD. Other useful book lists were a few recommendations given to me from Tumblr, which included the Nemesis series and Not Your Sidekick, both for their queer representation. Meanwhile, An Enchantment of Ravens and Rick Riordan selections were ones done by my own collection curation, while How's Moving Castle was recommended to me by a friend. During my fall 2018 semester at college, I had the chance to attend an event that hosted one of the authors of In Real Life and the author of The Summer of Jordi Perez, which is how I was exposed to these two books. 
As for My Hero Academia, I just so happened to see the anime on Crunchyroll because I'd heard so many good things about it. The thing to realize at the end of the day is that you're never going to know where your next entertaining piece of media is going to come from. Maybe you don't go actively hunting for book lists like I do, but I'd definitely say it's worth your time to consider diverse fiction that shows your experience or someone else's experience. Windows and mirrors, as they're called, are very important to the enjoyment of a book, whether we read for them as I do or not. If you're unfamiliar with the concept of windows and mirrors, it's basically a fancy way of saying this book shows someone else, as is the case of windows, or this book shows me, as is the case of mirrors. That being said, I hope you enjoyed my book list and maybe saw something that piqued your interest. If you want more recommendations based on what I read, feel free to ask for them in the comments. If you want to leave me suggestions, then also feel free to comment with them below. Literature doesn't have to be a solitary experience, and the honest enjoyment of it as a group can be a lot of fun. Plus, I know how much it can suck when you really love a book and no one around you can talk about it to you. Anyways, thanks for coming to this episode of Rook Talks Book Talks. Maybe I'll see you again next time with another book.